thank you, uh, Alana, to the World Affairs Council. Thank you to the Asociación Empresarios Mexicanos. Thank you to Genius Den for hosting us. Thank you all for coming on a Monday. I, I, I know it takes a, an additional effort. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in Mexico. We're kind of halfway into President Pe uh, Peña's term, and it's probably a good moment to take stock of what's happening uh, in the country. Also, as Fernando just mentioned, we have decided after 15 years of uh, solid growth in Mexico to expand our operations and we have opened up an office. Genius then is our host and uh, in, in not just for this speech. And Ana Paula Ambrosi, whom you will meet later, is heading up our, our effort. We're very excited about that. It makes us the first Mexican communications agency to go beyond, uh, to go beyond our borders. So we're very excited about that. I'll try to keep this relatively short so we have a bit of time for uh, questions and answers. If you can't hear me when I go like this, please holler, because otherwise Genius then is going to keep on prodding me to remember to keep the mic up, which is not something I do all the time. OK. Um, you know, a lot of people say that uh, the Mexican government and the Peña administration are a mess and a disaster and that everything that could possibly go wrong is going wrong. And they might have a point in that, yes, there are many things that are complicated and not going the way anyone would expect or anyone would want right now. But I always find it useful to give a little bit of perspective to things. I remember when uh, talking about President Calderón uh, nine years ago, ten years ago, and people criticizing whatever he may or may not have done, I would say, you know, bear in mind that in late November 2006, just before his inauguration, we did not know whether President Calderón was going to be able to take office because of the fractiousness in the Congress. It was not a given that we would have an orderly oath of office and therefore a constitutional president in 2006. So, you know, it's, it's good to remember those things when you're grading governments or administrations afterwards to see where they started and where they came from. And where the Peña administration began since the campaign and during and right after the elections was with very low expectations. Uh, people thought of uh, Enrique Peña as a very charismatic, uh, very handsome, good-looking, old-fashioned style politician who would be, as we say in Mexico, more form than substance. More good looks, more marketing strategy, more script, less politics to it. And uh, oh surprise, in the five or six months, which is an eternal transition between election day and taking office, I don't know why we do that in Mexico, but in this case, somebody did their homework and they managed to push forward what has been, I think, a landmark in the last quarter century in Mexico, which was the Pacto por México. And the Pacto por México was basically an agreement between the three main political parties, a couple of other ones tagged on at the end, but that, that was not really relevant, uh, on getting what we call the structural reforms finally approved. Energy reform, telecommunications reform, education reform, financial reform, fiscal reform, that everyone may or may not agree with the substance and the content of those reforms, but which were Again, for a quarter century, what everybody was pining for eternally. I remember since the mid-90s listening once and again and again and again in every conference, in every talk about Mexico, in every article you read, you would hear or read, if only we could get the structural reforms through, then this would be a different country. I don't know about that, but I do know that Thanks to the Pacto por México, we won't have to listen to that for at least 20 years. So that's a big relief. Um, Mexico became suddenly everybody's darling. 
Even since before the, um, at the inauguration, The Economist uh, had a cover, a very famous cover, titled The Rise of Mexico. Then the Financial Times, in a major zoological mistake, called us the Mexican tiger. There are no tigers in Mexico, except in the zoos. But anyway, I did mention to their correspondent at the time, this was the jaguar, not the tiger. Um, and uh, even Tom Friedman. Uh, said that Mexico was the place to uh, to look at, and definitely all political expectations were exceeded, and all this talk about it all being show and no substance was also off the um, off the board. However, the economy never quite uh, took off, and. Um, not to quote James Carville, but at the end of the day, that is what many people grade things on. Um, saving Mexico was still the big uh, story. I don't know what the time editors, uh, first of all, I don't know how relevant, uh, you know, I have fond memories of Time Magazine. I don't know whether it continues to be what it used to be. I'm afraid not so much, with, which was face saving for them, but that is not a cover that anyone would relish, uh, given everything that's happened. But again, you know, despite a lot of very important announcements, the Mexico City Airport, which will be a huge project, uh, a new uh, concept for a, a national security strategy, strategy, a new program to fight poverty, at the end of the day, the economy failing to take off, fiscal reform, tax reform hitting, the middle and upper middle classes especially hard, and of course the well-to-do, which is in a country like Mexico what you would expect a, fix, a fiscal reform to do. You know, a country that has, I'll talk more about poverty later, but a country that has 52, 53% of population living in poverty can't really expect a tax reform that doesn't tax the wealthy. But anyway, it was highly, highly unpopular. And after that, came, you know, almost like, um, like in a perf per perfectly scripted soap opera, everything suddenly collapsed. And everything began to collapse with the drama of uh, Ayotzinapa. Am I off the camera now? Only because I'm drinking water. I'm, I'm I'm sure I don't need to go into too many details. Everybody here is aware of what happened uh, to the 43 students. It was a tragedy. It was uh, a her one of the most horrendous things we've seen, um, even though some people argue numbers-wise worse things have happened in Mexico. These were, however, students. And these were students hoping to become teachers. And the country cannot let 43 future teachers, no matter what you think of their politics, of their ideology, of what they do, just can't let them disappear like that. And it can't let something like that happen to them. And the big problem was not so much that it, of course, it was terrible that it happened, but that the government took so long, the federal government, to realize how important this was. It let it languish for a couple of weeks in the hands of a notoriously corrupt state government, and even worse, municipal government, which was basically responsible for what happened. Uh, and it became the beginning of a downfall for the Peña administration. After that, sort of imagine a play at the theater where Everything has been going flowingly, and the lead character knows all his lines perfectly. And then suddenly he stumbles. And he stumbles. And I don't know if, if uh, any, anybody here is a fan of the theater, but if you are, you will see sometimes an actor stumble, forget a line, miss his spot, miss his cue. And then you have great actors who are able to catch up, improvise along the way, and improve upon it. You have so-so actors who manage to get back into place somehow. And then you have actors who get lost and who continue to be lost for the rest of the play. And at least for a year, this is what happened. 
everything after Ayotzinapa became an example of late reactions, bad political instinct, and very poor communication. And this is something I've said publicly in Mexico and I've said to their faces. So, you know, it's, it's no secret that this administration suddenly lost its bearings and is now trying to recover them. The White House case, the whole conflict of interest discussion, uh, El Chapo's escape, which uh, will make at least for a great movie someday, um, including the, the latest foiled uh, capture attempt. And with all of this, of course, came a decline in the president's popularity. Depending on which polls you look at, this is Pew uh, research. Um, 72% of Mexicans are dissatisfied with the way things are going in the country. I'm surprised it's not 99, because we Mexicans tend to be very critical of everything. And we, we tend to be a little bit more critical. I get a lot of flack sometimes uh, from our multinational clients who operate in Mexico. When I give them an assessment of something, it's not infrequent that they tell me, look, you guys are missing the big picture. You guys are you know, worrying about all the little details. Well, at the end of the day, it's the country we live in and the country we want to, uh, our, our children to grow up in. But anyway, uh, President Peña is less popular in his third year than President Calderón was at the end of his famously controversial administration. Having said that, uh, look at the approval ratings for other presidents in Latin America, and then he's almost a rock star, but that's another story. I mean, Vilma Rousseff throws a party when she gets double digits in the approval ratings, and I'm not exaggerating. Okay, this is um, another poll from El Universal, when Dian Laredo, again, end of August, and, uh, you know, the red is, in this case, the wrong direction that the country is going in and uh, the approval ratings are there below. We can, we can email this uh, to anyone who's interested uh, at the end if you just leave your cards with, uh, uh, with Ana Paula, uh, your credit card information, your banking information, and the name of your spouse and your firstborn. Um, again, no, this is Reforma. Basically, everything going wrong in the polls. And this is an interesting one, because this shows the level of confidence in Mexican institutions. This is, first of all, it's relevant because it goes beyond politics uh, or beyond party politics. Second, because it is a yearly, Consulta Mitowski does this uh, poll regularly. So it kind of shows you who is improving, who is uh, getting worse. Blue is 2012, red is 13, and green is 14. And you will see at the top of the confidence meter, the army. And that's interesting because traditionally in Mexico, the army has played a, a non-combat role, as many, you know, those of you who know Mexico are aware. But in the last six, seven years, it has been very active. Um, in second place, universities. In third place, the church. It always used to be the church in first place, so scandals have definitely had an impact there. And then, I love this, the media, meaning print, then radio, and then television. And why do I love this? Because everyone in Mexico says, you can't trust the media. You can't believe a thing you read, hear, or listen to in the media. Yet, they rank higher than the National Elections Institute. They rank higher than businessmen. They rank higher than the Supreme Court. And then way at the end, and this will be no surprise, the unions, then congressmen, and then the political parties. They rank, all of those rank, including senators, below the police. And that is really saying something in Mexico. Okay, so what are the good and what are the, the bad so far? As I said, the Pact for Mexico, the 12 structural reforms. I'll move over here, Fernando, so you can get a picture, but remember the pumpkin. 
please. Um, education reform, which was arguably the most complicated of all the reforms and the one that held the most difficulties in terms of implementation, what the government has done so far is pretty amazing in terms of weakening the two unions that were holding back education. And I tell you this as someone who, in my youth, believed in unions. And unfortunately, Mexico is you know, textbook example of how unions can go wrong in so many uh, in so many terrible ways. But a lot of progress in education reform, it will take a long time. Uh, macro stability is very impressive. There, there are no, in spite of the peso uh, devaluation, in spite of everything, the slow economic growth, whatever, the fundamentals are pretty, are pretty good. Small decrease in unemployment, which points a little bit to growth and a lot to formalizing workers. So many workers who were off the books or many workers who were not getting social insurance uh, benefits now are. Then I go over to the wrongs. Of course, El Chapo, um, of course, the White House, Yotzinapa, an increase in poverty and inequality. I'll address that in a minute. Uh, and then you'll notice I have put both on the plus and on the minus side weak economic growth and the exchange rate. And why? Because, yes, we're having very weak economic growth, but much better than most countries in Latin America and other parts of the world. And the exchange rate, because A, it has, even though it's been about a 25% drop, it has not affected inflation. We're having historically low inflation levels right now. And it's been managed in such a way that, yes, it's created a lot of disgruntled travelers. I mean, the people who complain the most are those people who usually come here to shop or want to go to Europe or whatever. Most companies are not hurting terribly. Uh, so it's been relatively well managed. And of course, a lot of challenges ahead in terms of accountability, transparency, security, rule of law, but I'll get into, into some of that in, um, in a minute. There were 10 major announcements. I'll uh, go over this very quickly in the, in the third informe, which was sort of the official launch of the second half of the administration. Probably uh, laws to fight crime, corruption, improve uh, transparency, and uh, rendition de cuentas, as we call it, accountability. Uh, are very important. Bonds for educational infrastructure are very important. And uh, new financial instruments to, basically this is to, to keep investment flowing into, into public works without uh, greater debt. Surprise, elections arrive with slow growth, with the peso plummeting, uh, with the president's approval ratings in the doldrums, so you would say, obviously, the opposition wins, right? No, surprise. The PRI held its majority, um, had three new political parties participating, one of them, uh, Mr. López Obrador uh, and Morena. You had two parties lose their re uh, registration, and most significant of the midterms, the entry into the scenario of independent candidates, non-party candidates. One of them won the governorship of Nuevo León. He's the one who's made the most headlines. He's also the one who is the least independent. And uh, we can get into that in the, in the Q&A session. But this is a guy who was in the PRI for 30 years, left disgruntled because he did not get the, uh, the nomination he wanted at the time, and then won the election with the backing of all the major business groups and the major media outlet of Nuevo León. So call me cynical, but that doesn't really sound independent to me. Well, establishment. This is um, how it used to look. This is how, it's, how it now looks. Uh, yes, the PRI lost 11 seats, uh, but so did the PAN, and so did the PRD, and they lost even more. The Green Party, which is, you know, 
green, I think, in, thinking in dollar terms, not in, in environmental terms. Uh, they won uh, very big. And uh, at, at the end of the day, the PRI had already achieved, and President Peña had already achieved everything he really needed a big majority in Congress for, which were constitutional reforms. Now he just needs a 50% plus one to get his budgets passed. But essentially, all the heavy lifting in the Congress was done at the beginning of the administration, which I think was a very smart uh, strategy, because after uh, the first half of the, uh, any administration in Mexico, you can't get anything through in the Congress. And this is turnout. You know, uh, again, you would have thought people are upset, people are cynical, so either they're going to turn out in droves and vote the government out, or they're going to all stay home. They did neither. The dips here, you see here, are the midterms. Usually, less people vote in the midterms. I think the same happens in the US. Um, but higher turnout in 215 than in 209. So evidently, uh, something is not going according to the pundits. And this is how the states look. I don't know what this thing with the color purple is, but anyway, that's supposed to mean independent. But uh, other than that, blue is PAN, red is PRI, uh, yellow is PRD. Nothing dramatic changed, but if anything, um, if anything, the PRI was able to maintain most of its positions and win a very important one in, uh, in the state of Sonora. Um, and this will be next year. Next year, we have 13 governorships up for grabs, literally up for grabs when you look at the list of people trying to become governors. Uh, shows we are so, so democratic now that literally anyone, it's almost like Washington, literally anyone can run for governor or president or what have you. I know I'm in Texas, I'm going to be very careful <laughs> with everything I say. But again, at the end of the day, it's all about the economy. And the one thing I cannot wrap my head around is why are we consistently missing expectations? Every time you have an estimate of growth, whether it's the World Bank, whether it's the Bank of Mexico, whether it's OECD, whether it's uh, the Ministry of Finance, they are adjusted makes it very complicated for people like me who speak in public or give uh, talks like this because you're always wondering, my God, do I have the right graph this time around or did I miss one? Uh, I'm going to start numbering them or putting a date on them. But anyway, um, I think if we end up slightly above 2% growth this year, we'll be, uh, we'll be lucky. But again, as I was telling you a minute ago, these are... <laughs> Uh, CEPAL's uh, growth uh, expectations for the region, the average for the region this year is 0.5%. So if Mexico were to clock 2%, even 1.8, we would be three and a half to four times above the regional average. And with the exception of Colombia, Peru, and Panama, but Panama is difficult to use as a, as a standard, Everybody else is, you know, Brazil is uh, decreasing, Argentina, nobody believes their numbers with all due respect. I don't know if there are any Argentinians in the room. Uh, if there are any Argentinians, please tell me, then I'll say you're growing 10%. <laughs> It'll be the same. Nobody will believe me anyway. Um, and uh, this is sort of how the economy has been behaving. So, again, very poor 2013, slightly better 14, and then an up and down-ish 15 so far. But the main thing here is it's remained stable and inflation is ridiculously low. In, uh, in the month of uh, September, the forecasts are for the lowest recorded inflation in Mexico since we started measuring, which is not a bad, uh, not a bad thing. We used to have 2.5 inflation in a week, and this is uh, the yearly accumulated. So it's uh, that's that's a pretty that's a pretty good thing. Uh, positive dip, uh, debt ratings. I won't bore you with that. 
peso starting to stabilize again. And, um, you know, a lot of people make a lot of noise about the decline of the peso. I am not one of them because everybody was complaining a year, year and a half ago about the peso being too strong. So I think we're finally getting to where we should be. And, uh, of course, one of our big challenges is competitiveness. We are still very bureaucratic, very complicated. You know, when I think of what we've had to do to set up an office here, to incorporate, to get our tax ID number, our banking, and so on, it's been a breeze. I mean, not that Ana Paula is uh, in, in, in any way not masterful, but it's been very simple. In Mexico, it's terribly complicated. I mean, for God's sake, you have to go to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to make sure that the name you want to register is not already registered somewhere. I was going to say Saudi Arabia, but I, I'll skip Saudi Arabia because our new consul just arrived from uh, Riyadh. Uh, I, you'll tell us later which one is the hardship post, whether Riyadh or, or Dallas. Um, but anyway, we are 61st, uh, according to the Global Competitiveness Index, uh, and we have a big issue with poverty. And uh, this, is a, this is a big deal because at the end of the day, no matter how you measure, and Mexico has set the bar very high, and this is something that's probably worth remembering when you, when you talk about this. By Mexican standards, if Brazil you were to use the same standards for defining poverty as Mexico does, Brazil would have 25 or 30 million more people living in poverty. So we have set the bar very high. Still, you know, to have a country like Mexico with about half of the population living just at or below the poverty line and having 11 and a half million people living in extreme poverty is just absolutely unacceptable socially economically ethically any just about any way you can you can you you can think it we're it, it's a very complicated issue I've, I've been dabbling in it recently a little bit to understand a little bit more uh, basically what that shows you is that not only has poverty increased, but also the number of people who are just on the threshold has increased. And that's obviously not, uh, not good news. Um, doing business in Mexico, well, you know, everything is relative, as, uh, as they say. But, um, you know, 39th out of uh, 190 is not exactly uh, great and where we want to be, yet people do business with Mexico. People invest, people create jobs, uh, Mexican entrepreneurs continue to do things. Uh, we're not branching out because of anything other than the fact that we've essentially exha exhausted our growth possibilities in Mexico because we have a very strict uh, non-conflict of interest policy. So we, we can't work for competitors. So we've been lucky enough, and I touch wood, that you know we work for major players in most industries. So, you know, if you work with Pepsi, you can't work with Coke. And, um, my God, please tell me we're serving Pepsi here. But anyway, um, lots of free trade agreements. If we devoted a tenth of the energy we devote to free trade agreements to getting people out of poverty in Mexico, we would probably equal the markets uh, that we are uh, currently dealing with. And um, this is sort of where foreign investment uh, comes from to Mexico. The U.S. is the blue, obviously a key player. And where does it go? Just about everywhere, including professional services, business services, mining, and of course now a lot going to energy. Um, we have a very complicated relationship with the, with the U.S. Some would say we're blessed. Some would, some will say we're uh, damned by or cursed by by history. Um, I lived my my parents were diplomats, and I lived as a child in Israel. And uh, my mother mentioned to to an Israeli politician one day this old saying about you know they they attributed it to Porfirio Diaz. 
poor Mexico, so far from God and so close to the United States. And the Israeli said, you know, Madam Ambassador, we say it exactly the other way around here. Say, poor Israel, so close to God and so far from the United States. <laughs> so I guess everything is, uh, is relative. We have lots of opportunities, we have lots of issues, uh, and I personally have a big concern. I think everybody should be free to elect whoever they, they choose, but the fact that the leading candidate for the Republican Party is having such an aggressively anti-immigrant and anti-Latino rhetoric. It's not that it worries me that it will become government policy. I still have hopes for common sense and decency in, in the voters. What worries me is that it becomes politically and socially, socially acceptable to say these things. So these, you know, what Trump is saying is what many people were thinking but did not say out loud because it was rude, because it was politically incorrect, because it was insensitive, because what have you, uh, nonsensical as well. Now you have a character who is leading the Republican polls, who's on television every day saying this thing, so suddenly the closet racist, the closet, the closet uh, discriminatory person feels he can actually go out and say it he can actually go out and, and do something about it. And do something about it usually means discriminate, mistreat, or attack. So that is what uh, concerns me the, the most about Mr. Trump and, uh, and, and sort of the, the radical anti-immigrant wing of the, um, of the Republican Party. And finally, and I, I close with this, these are obstacles and uh, opportunity. Mexico needs to strengthen rule of law. Uh, it needs to fight corruption. It's, you know, there's no way you can strengthen Mexican institutions and get more people to trust them if corruption is continued to be seen as a driving force in Mexico. Education, and of course, you know, if we, if we get um, the US economy growing rapidly again, that will provide a major boost. What are our obstacles? Violence and public security, that is not going away anytime soon. And it would be unrealistic to think it can go away. We, we let it grow and fester for too long. I'm not going to get into the discussion. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. I mean, who is really at fault? The consumers or the suppliers or the transit countries or everybody's at fault at the end of the day. Uh, and I think it's hypocritical for any country to say it's their problem. The fact of the matter is we let it grow to this extent just like the Colombians did. And I'm sorry, but the Colombians, they have been very good at managing the perception of the problem. But Colombia today has a violent murder rate that is about 45% higher than Mexico's. So if anybody tells you they've solved that, Sorry, they haven't. They've just handled it very well from a communications and media perspective. And, uh, you know, it's good for them. You know, they have been able to change perceptions, but the reality is still there, and that's going to be an issue uh, in Mexico for many, for many years to come. And uh, with that, I thank you very much. I hope, I don't know how we are for time, but if you have any questions, comments, I'll be more than happy to try to answer. Please. Okay, on demographics, uh, population growth is now below 2%, which is a dramatic improvement over what used to be 3.8, 3.9% back in the mid-late 70s. Uh, Mexico did institute very, um, I think, very proactive policies in terms of education uh, for everyone, about birth control, about you know, not having too many children and so on, continues to be an issue of the poor families having more children, of course, but we're, we're going to be facing a bit of a problem 20 years from now because our pyramid is no longer going to be the big youth surge that we have right now. Maybe 20 years from now we'll be, we'll be having to listen to a Mexican Donald Trump complaining about Hondurans and Salvadorans and Guatemalans. And that's unfortunately the way, the way history works. The church 
is probably less radical today on both ends. You don't have the very active uh, liberation theology uh, priests, which were highly visible, and probably the latest example of that was Samuel Ruiz in Chiapas. But you also don't have the most senior heads of the church being as radically conservative as somewhere in the, uh, in, in the past. So I think the church has tended to diminish its extremes, if you, if you would. Uh, it doesn't play as important a role as it used to in, in Mexican public life. You saw the graph, their prestige, their reputation has diminished. All the scandals are not for nothing. Um, this pope is a bit of a toss-up. I mean, he's not, um, uh, he's not Voitila, who was a big fan on, of Mexico and everybody adored him. We have, and I say this in all earnestness, uh, we may make jokes about Argentinians, but they're not really jokes. They're anecdotes. And there's, there's something there, you know, Pope Francis doesn't seem to especially like Mexico, and he's taken a long time in finally deciding to visit Mexico. The fact that he was here and did not make a brief visit to our north, I think was you know, very telling in that uh, sense. His excuse that he couldn't go to Mexico without visiting the Virgin of Guadalupe is, pardon me, I don't think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a serious comment. Um, but then the other challenge for the church in Mexico is the, the dramatic growth of other denominations. And that is moving along very quickly, um, gaining ground. And these are, you know, you sh there's all kinds uh, of denominations. There are you know, some that are very radical, if you would, or very extreme in their views. But many emphasize hard work, no drinking, and um, that holds an appeal, especially for women in, in poorer parts of the country who want their husbands to abide by that. So it's, it's, had a, it's been a radical uh, change just about everywhere. Um, we, in, in our office, we have the sort of the janitor, handyman, uh, night watchman, what have you, is uh, an, an active Christian, and he would proselytize. We finally convinced him that it was not a good idea to proselytize, especially to young uh, female professionals whom he told that they really should be at home uh, educating their children, which they did not yet have. So anyway, but you know, it, it, it becomes more and more present every day. So the Catholic Church is not, not what it used to be. I hope I answered your question. Please, back there, and, and then you. Mm -hmm. um, a house that the First Lady bought on credit. Are, are you familiar with that? It's called the Casa Blanca in, in, in Mexico, because it's a, it's a huge house, and it happens to be white. Mm -hmm. I don't think um, there is any data yet. Um, then again, it's relatively soon to, to talk about that. Um, I think, oh, I'm sorry, the, the question was uh, whether the legalization of marijuana in some states in the U.S. has affected revenues for, for the drug cartels in Mexico. Um, there's no evidence of it yet. I don't think um, marijuana is it, is, it probably makes for a lot of bulk in terms of trafficking. I don't think it necessarily makes for the most profits or for the most amounts of money. Um, if you ask me, uh, I think that is probably, you know, in Mexico, in the U.S. and in other countries, marijuana makes the bulk of everything. It makes the bulk kilo-wise. It makes the bulk of arrests, of raids, and of people in jail. And it's sort of a an oxymoron at the end of the day. You know, how, how many resources are devoted and how much jail space is devoted who, to people who are dabbling in something that many 
states and many countries now consider, if not legal, then at least something that should be tolerated. So that, that's a whole other discussion. Um, the one thing I do know uh, is, you know, no matter where you stand on legalization of drugs, the recipe that has been in place for the last 50, 60 years clearly does not work. So it's not a question of you know, whether drugs should be legal or not. It's a question of whatever we are all collectively doing right now is a sham. It is, it's a disgrace because it, it doesn't work in any way and it does harm an incredible amount of, um, of people. Yes, uh, it has to do with education in Mexico. And, uh, you know, the, the, the huge number of people that don't receive adequate education, whether anything is being done to address that, or is there a change of uh, mindset? Did I kind of translate your... Um, I think, yes, there is. And uh, education reform and, you know, again, all these reforms were passed by the three major parties. So this is not touting uh, anyone in particular or, you know, I'm not banging on anyone's drum. Um, it is the first time in 25 years that anybody has dared to touch the unions. And there were, you know, one leading union that was, that was headed by Elvester Gordillo, whom you may or may not have heard of. She was the most powerful woman in Mexico, she headed a union comprising 1.2 million school teachers, largest union in Latin America, very politicized union. She was responsible for Felipe Calderón winning the 2006 election because she founded a political party and she instructed and got, got about 80% of her voters to follow her instructions, which were vote for our guys for Congress, but vote Pan and Calderón for the presidency. And that is the exact difference in votes that Calderón or the Pan had for the president and for Congress, about 500, 600,000. Without that, Calderón would not have won. And then you had an offshoot of the, of the union uh, known as La Coordinadora, uh, which is very active in Michoacán, Guerrero, especially Oaxaca, and some parts of Chiapas and some small parts of Mexico City. Very combative, very aggressive, very violent, and they would essentially hijack uh, the state of Oaxaca, for example. They would suspend classes, they would, what have you. We, we, we could spend a lot of time on that. Uh, Mrs. Gordillo is in jail now. And uh, again, people said this, this is a woman who got the Secretary of Education in the Fox administration to later serve as chairman of her own party, who got her son-in-law to be under Secretary of Primary Education in Mexico. I mean, <clears throat> if that's not a conflict of interest. The, um, Minister of Education under Calderón, Alonso Lojambio, rest in peace, he, he passed away. He would literally go and pick her up to escort her to public events. It was shameful. And now she's in jail on corruption, tax evasion, money laundering charges. She had, uh, I think the, the most affected by that is uh, uh, Neiman Marcus in San Diego, and I'm not kidding, she had a, she, she, she had a huge uh, bill running there constantly. Um, and the, um, the teachers union in Oaxaca has basically had to retrench after they had control of the Ministry of Education in Oaxaca. Again, you know, the union running their, theoretically, their boss's uh, job. Uh, that's been stripped away from them, therefore resources. For the first time, we have an almost full uh, calendar of activities in school, this school year. So instead of 
80%, you've got 97% of kids going to school regularly today. It's going to take a long time. It's a step up. For the first time ever, we've instituted uh, mandatory evaluations for teachers. That's something I know is a big issue, say, in New York City. I don't, I don't know what the, uh, how it works here in Texas. But um, it was a no-go for many years. So, slowly. But at, finally, something is being done about it. It's going to take a long time. And I agree with you, we're wasting a lot of human capital there. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'll go back there. I'll, I'll come back to you. I just want to let some people in the back have a, have a say. I don't foresee any major problems on, on the Mexican side, especially because it goes to the Senate and the, and, and the PRI has a more comfortable majority in the Senate in Mexico. Um, I think it's a common sense move. You know, we could have a long discussion on the merits or the, or the f failures and shortcomings of uh, free trade. I think at the end of the day, it's where the world is going. Uh, you can argue forever about it, but you know, if anybody here is a football fan, they change the rules on field goals. Do we stand and argue about it, or do we try to kick field goals better? So that's the direction the, the world is going. And uh, not to quote myself, but a few years ago, I was having a, a talk like this with university students and someone came out with a very powerful anti-globalization speech. It was supposed to be a question, but it was actually a speech. You've heard those. Um, and after he was finished, he was very eloquent. Uh, I said, okay, just a you know, quick question. Where was your shirt made? And where were your shoes made? And where are the sunglasses that you're wearing made? And then you know, it became evident that, that that is the game we're playing today. So TPP just moves further along uh, in that sense. So somebody else here, and then I'll, I'll go to you, sir. Um, I, th I think pretty strong and severe and uh, effective. Uh, there was a report out just a few days ago um, documenting, and I, I think the New York Times ran a story on it, uh, documenting how... Uh, strict Mexico's policing of the southern borders and how strict its deportation of uh, undocumented, uh, I prefer to, to call them undocumented migrants, but it's, you know, my, my choice. No, 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 please. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, not offended in the least. Um, it's, I have mixed feelings about it. I understand the logic. Um, I have a problem with the ethics. And I, I tend to have a problem with double standards. So I think, you know, if on the one hand, you're demanding humane treatment in the U.S. for Mexican migrants, and you're not granting it to those who come from south of the border. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't really make me feel comfortable. Having said that, I understand that in order for Mexicans to be better treated here, and in order for migration to be less of an issue between the U.S. and Mexico, we need to have stronger policing of our southern border. So it's, um, it's a tough one. Um, at the end of the day, most migrants who cross into Mexico are not intending to stay in Mexico. They're all trying to get, or most of them are trying to get to the, to the US. So uh, the, the good news, if you want to see it that way, is that enforcement is a lot stronger. The bad news, if you want to see it that way, is that enforcement is a lot stronger. The question is whether the new independent candidates are going to change the way we do politics in Mexico. Um, do you think Ross Perot made a difference in the way politics are run in the US? Do you think Donald Trump will make a difference unless he were to win? I, I'm, I'm very skeptical about independent candidates because again, uh, Independence is very relative, and in a game where a lot of it is about money, how truly independent can you be? So, sure, you can get, say, the new mayor of Guadalajara is an outstanding guy. He's an independent. Uh, there's a federal congressman, uh, Manuel Cloutier. He's, I think he's a very powerful voice. 
I think the new governor of Nuevo León is a shame. I mean, this is a man who is, forget about uneducated and uncultured, he is a walking conflict of interest. He named a business associate of his who is a senior partner in a housing firm as Minister of Urban Development in Nuevo León. I mean, uh, and uh, I, I, I don't see uh, El Bronco who is so, uh, now, you know, he, he reminds me so much of Vicente Fox in his demeanor and his approach to things. Uh, but Fox, I think, was less venial, uh, if, if that's the right word. Um, I'm, 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 I'm not disappointed in El Bronco because I never had high expectations, but he really has exceeded my, my low expectations. The question is how uh, the PR issue was resolved when it came out that Time Magazine, that the Mexican government paid, magazine, paid Time Magazine for that cover. That's the question. To my knowledge, Time Magazine does not accept money for covers. If you have any other information, I'd be happy to see. Hasta, hasta donde yo sé, sorry, I'll, 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 I'll go into Spanish. Um, hasta donde yo sé, pero no, o sea, no soy ni vocero de Time, ni vocero de la presidencia, ni de nadie. Eh, hasta, donde, hasta donde yo sé, Time no vende ni nunca ha vendido sus portadas. Eh, eso es lo que yo sé. ¿No? Y, y, y conozco profesionalmente bastante bien la prensa extranjera porque me he dedicado muchos años a eso. Eh, no es eh, la revista Hola, que es así, vende sus portadas, o quién, o algunas de esas. No, y digo, así funcionan. Este, yo creo que fue un rumor. O sea, yo esa no la había oído. Y mire que oigo de todo. Este, esa no la había yo escuchado, no lo creo. De no, no, o sea, no me toca a mí desmentirlo, pero es, esa no la había yo escuchado y se me haría muy raro. Sorry, I was basically saying I doubt uh, that time, no matter its uh, decline in circulation, I doubt that it sells its covers. Not that they do much good. In, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, any politician who thinks that by buying media presence he is going to improve his performance is mistaken. At the end of the day, you know, they cover you for what you do, or at least they should. That is called making use of being the host. <laughs> or does that make you the hostess with the mostest? If you ask me if Mexico had to solve one single thing and no other, it would be rule of law. There is no problem in Mexico that is not somehow related to the lack of comprehensive rule of law. Nothing. Education, infrastructure, social, you name it. There's not a single thing. Um, it's a very difficult process because it's not just about the government. First of all, it's about all the governments, so the federal, state, the municipal. You would think, you know, when President Calderón started pushing for single unified police forces, not at the national level, at the state level, the resistance, and it still has not fully come through. You, know, you still have people, the new mayor of Cuernavaca, bless his soul, he's a f soccer player or a football player, uh, Cuauhtémoc Blanco, obstinately refuses. He wants to have his own police. And it's, you know, it's a nice toy to have, and it's, if you're corrupt, it's a great source of money and what have you. But if something as simple and commonsensical as that cannot be implemented, just imagine the resistance to major policy changes. Then the other thing is, you know, we, 
when, when I have a chance to give a talk in Mexico and the subject of corruption comes up or rule of law, I ask people to raise their hand if in the last month they have not broken any law or regulation. And you would be surprised. Oh, you wouldn't be surprised. Uh, I've been surprised by how few people raise their hands. Uh, not because I think they're too few. I think those that do are not being fully honest at the end of the day. You know, I, I had this fantastic forum the other day to talk about the future of the media. And um, there were, you know, Javier Solorzano was there and Leopoldo Gomez was there and uh, three, four people. And uh, a very obstinate uh, fellow who said he was a, a professor uh, I think at ITAM, nothing against ITAM. Um, I said, you're sure? I mean, you haven't gone over the speed limit. No, no, no. I'm, and he was really, you know, the only one. I said, okay, because Mexico City just passed a new set of traffic laws. I said, can you tell me what the speed limit is? I said, I don't know. I said, well, how do you know you're obeying the speed limit if you don't know the speed limit? But we have a problem with that. Everybody seems to think in Mexico that the law is made for everybody else. And, and that's a huge issue. And we also have a big issue in terms of calling people to account, not just legally, but also socially. You know, I always point to a fact. There, in... in uh, sort of the, the club that I attend, there are two very well-to-do individuals there. One, during the big crisis in 95, when all the banks uh, went into meltdown in Mexico, one of them took refuge in what we called at the time Foba Proa. This is sort of you know, what, what you guys did when, when uh, lending institutions were bailed out here in the 2008-2009 crisis. One of them took refuge there and was essentially bailed out by taxpayers and continued to live incredibly well throughout. The other one is a businessman from Monterrey who sold everything he had, literally. Companies, homes, horses, everything to pay every single one of his debts. And now he again is a flourishing businessman. Alfonso Romo. I won't say the name of the first one because, God forbid, he might be friends with anybody here. And then they'll go back and gossip to him and then he'll put something in my drink. Um, you would think everybody would want to hang out with the guy who paid all his debts, right? No. They say, ah, he's difficult. He's always questioning you. Ah, he likes Mr. Lopez Obrador. Ah, Better, uh, better not. It's stuck to somebody else. If we don't, if we're not even capable of rewarding good behavior or punishing bad behavior, we're in trouble. So it's it's a long road ahead. Now, to finally get to your question, I think, ironically, because of all the scandals regarding transparency and conflict of interest and, uh, and what have you that this administration has faced, they may be tempted to try to push forward a very strong anti-corruption law, which is what I understand they're doing. So it's one of those things where you, know, you get your hands caught in the cookie jar and then you say, okay, now I'm going to really institute a diet in this house. So. Hopefully that will happen. But again, un until we don't change socially, you know, the moment Mexicans start behaving in Mexico the way they behave when they travel, that will be another story. And I think we have time for one more question. And I see somebody back there, please. Um, indigenous communities and what uh, policies are there in place? I, I missed the last part. Was it without criminalizing them? or? Commercializing. Okay. Um, 
Yes, there is a, a, a national institute for indigenous affairs or for Indian affairs, as you might call it here. Um, it is very limited in scope and very limited in budget. Um, it's, it's a tough one because on the one hand, you want to provide public services and infrastructure and better education and what have you. Uh, on the other hand, cultural conservationists might argue that that goes against the, the essence of the indigenous communities. So it's, it's a tough call policy-wise. You know, how do you best support them? Uh, without commercializing, I understand that as, you know, without falling into the caricature of having them appear sort of as characters in, uh, in tourist towns. But, at, you know, how do you manage to combine supporting their traditions and then finding out which are the right traditions to support? Let me give you a couple of examples. Indian communities in Chiapas, which I'm very familiar with, uh, because part of my family is from there, or in Yucatan, or in Oaxaca, they tend to believe in communal decisions. That means that when the time comes for an election, everyone votes. This is, you know, people for the longest time thought this was part of the vote rigging that took place in Mexico. I'm not saying vote rigging didn't take place. It did, but that was not part of it. That was the council of elders deciding which candidate and which party they were going to support. So you look at election results for local elections in Chiapas, Oaxaca, Yucatan, some parts of Tabasco, and you will find 100% turnout and 100% of the votes for one party. And it may be the opposite party the next election because that's what they decided. Is that democratic in our understanding of democracy? No. They are against women holding office. That is a custom. They, what, what in Mexico, in Spanish, we refer to as usos y costumbres. Is it something that should be supported? I don't think so. Uh, sometimes of, some types of punishment for criminals. Well, they run against uh, what we would consider our basic tenets of the law. So it's, it's a tough one. Um, you know, how do you reconcile respect for traditions and customs with implementing, say, equal opportunities in education for women in communities where they tend to keep girls away from school because that is their habit or that is their custom. So it's, it's a difficult one. I'm not justifying anything. I'm just pointing to the, to the complexity. Having said that, I don't think the government in Mexico, and not just this administration, I think for the last 50 years, I don't think anybody has done a good job of tending to indigenous communities in Mexico. And if you look at poverty rates, you will find that you know, maybe half of the population lives in poverty, but 95% of Indian communities or indigenous communities in Mexico live in poverty. So we have a huge issue there. Hope I answered your, your question. From your look, we could have a debate on this. So I'll be more than happy to do it next time. OK, so I am sensing knives being thrown at me from over here on the right. Thank you all very much.